Ooh, that's a pretty sobering opening picture there. So maybe I'll start with that. It's a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, 71 AD. By the way, a little caveat, all of the dates I'm going to be giving on this show, I'm going to appear to be inconsistent by about one or two years uh, floating them around. And that's because different sources are inconsistent by a couple of years. So whether it was, you know, whether one says 70 AD or 71 AD or 72 AD, uh, or the same thing with the later revolt, 130 AD, 132 AD. There are lots of problems. Uh, calendars have also changed, and there are also problems with dating. So anyway, I put 71 AD up on that slide. And uh, that's kind of where I'm going to be starting talking about Judaism today. Um, of course, this is What is Judaism? Part 3. And uh, Parts 1 and Part 2 uh, were fundamentally what was Judaism and what was the role of Judaism from the Garden of Eden, from the creation of the world, until, until uh, let's say, the coming of Christ, and, or the destruction of the Temple in 70 AD, but around that period. So that's my plan. My plan was for parts one and two to kind of bring us up to Christ. I know there was a little overlap. I talked about the Talmud and so forth. But, and then today to talk about Judaism, the period between essentially the coming of Christ and the codification of the Talmud, let's say. So let's say we're talking about essentially 70 AD to 500 AD. I think that's all I'll get to today. And then uh, in the next episode, I will talk about the subsequent centuries. And I don't know how far I'll get, whether I'll get up to the present day or if I'll only get up to uh, modern times or the end of the medieval times or whatever. Uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. But so that's the plan for this uh, series of um, talks uh, or, or whatever they are, live streams. And um, so back to that opening image. There are a lot of images of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it's, of course, a very important event in Christianity. Among other things, Jesus foretold it and in, in actually in a number of places, including Luke 21. And uh, he said it while he was alive, you know, no two stones will be left one on top of the other and so forth. And the Jerusalem, mm, I don't have the, the quote in my head, I don't think. Uh, the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and um, Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword and the Jews will let be led captive among all nations and so forth. And Jerusalem will be trodden out, down under the feet of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and then will come the second coming. I've talked about that passage. I can't go back there now or I'll never move forward. So the fall of Jerusalem has always been seen in Christianity, certainly since the Apostolic Fathers, as um, a consequence of the Jews' rejection of Christ. I'll just put it that way. Uh, and that the role of Jerusalem was obviated, was, um, was um, abrogated, so to speak, by the Jewish world's rejection of Christ and not entering the church. So, the fall of Jerusalem has always been a, a big theme in Christianity. It's kind of used as indirect evidence, even, of the truth of Christianity, of the fact that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And, of course, the destruction of the temple was kind of necessary to make sense, out, in some sense, out of Christian theology being the continuation, or let me rephrase that. The problem is that Judaism was transformed into the Catholic Church. Judaism, before the coming of Christ, had a sacramental system that was effective in remitting sins and taking away sins. It required temple sacrifice. The temple was a very busy place. A lot was going on there. And it really was the dwelling of God on earth. And this, uh, the temple sacrifices really were a sacramental system for salvation. Then along comes Christ and Christianity, and the true sacrifice is, is performed, the Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary, of which all of the Jewish sacrifices were simply a prefigurement. And so just think how absurd it would be if 
the Jewish sacrifices had continued indefinitely thereafter. It's much more visibly logical to say that to see that the temple was destroyed and the sacrifices ceased around the time that the true sacrifice was fulfilled, Jesus on the cross. And I talked about last show the fact that yes, there was this 40 year uh, buffer period between Jesus's crucifixion on Calvary and the destruction of the temple. But even the Jewish sources say that for those 40 years, the Jewish sacrifices were not effective for the remission of sins of the Jewish people. I talked about that when I talked about the miracle of the scarlet cord or the miracle of the scarlet thread. So again, I don't want to, you know, repeat that. But so it's eminently logical, of course, for the truth of Christianity, that at least the temple would be destroyed and perhaps even Jerusalem would be destroyed. Now, the reason I chose the particular image that I did choose, um, which uh, I will, oh boy, if I bring it up, the music will start so automatically. So I'll bring it up for the picture. Or maybe I can actually, um, mm, no, I think I, the music will start. So forgive me for that. I'll bring it up because I want to talk about the picture a little bit and I will have to, oh no, I did turn off the music, good. So you see there that is not only the destruction of Jerusalem in the sense of the tremendous uh, suffering and destruction of the people. As a matter of fact, there are accounts that uh, mothers, uh, the siege of Jerusalem was extremely brutal and it lasted a long time. And uh, there are accounts of contemporaries that not only were the streets running with blood, at times, but that mothers actually ate their infant children. The starvation was so bad. And so you see horrible pictures of suffering there. But you also see the angels there. And that's, I think, um, why I chose it because and you see, by the way, in the upper right hand corner, the the Roman troops who were going to come in after the siege, obviously, when they managed to to break the siege uh, rather um, break the walls through after the siege. And so anyway, so you see the fall of Jerusalem more or less from a spiritual Christian perspective, the angels hovering over angels of chastisement, I would imagine, and so forth, the flames in the background. So it's kind of a, a nicely spiritual view of things. And um, the uh, let me see if I have, I have another picture here of the destruction of Jerusalem, which is, um, you know, more kind of straightforwardly not spiritual, but just again, the people jumping off the walls to their death. The, the death and destruction was absolutely inconceivable. Um, and in fact, I'm thinking about where to go right now. The um, one of the things that made that period between when the Romans started the siege of Jerusalem and when they finally broke through the walls, um, I think it was about a year and a half later. I don't remember offhand exactly. I'll, I'll get back on the screen now myself was that, in fact, and I hate to say this because I keep sounding anti-Semitic, but there was terrible infighting among three sects of Jews under the siege, in other words, within the old, within Jerusalem, behind the walls, there were various sects of Jews who were at each other's throats and even violently at each other's throats, actually armies, separate armies attacking each other and uh, that wanted to proceed. I'm getting way ahead of myself. So, okay, forget that. That was just a little introduction. I'll get back to the siege of Jerusalem and to the 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 um, fall of Jerusalem and so forth. But let me, uh, maybe that's a good place to start, or rather I can just continue off from there. So anyway, so how did this come about? Let's go back, let's kind of go back to about 66 AD, so a few years before the fall of Jerusalem. And... Um, what happened was, this was during the reign of Nero, and what happened was that, um, 
I actually had the wrong notes in front of me. So forgive me for having to, having to, um, um, having to kind of ad lib a little bit. But what happened was essentially that the Romans had decided to um, build a pagan temple. Um, uh, oh boy, am I embarrassing myself? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind. Uh, I wish I could rewind and start over. Okay, but anyway, so uh, we're, let's go back to 66 uh, AD. And the, um, the tensions were uh, building up uh, between the, the Jews who wanted independence, of course, and the Roman authorities. We saw that already in the New Testament at the time of Jesus. And there were um, uh, anti-taxation protests. The Jews refused to pay the Roman taxes. Now, the whole issue around conquest in those days had a lot to do with taxes. You actually see this already in the Old Testament when um, the Assyrians conquered the northern tribes and so forth. Most of the motivation for the conquests was that then you had the ability to confiscate property from those subject people. So that was always a source of tension. You saw, of course, in the New Testament, all of the discussion of tax collectors um, and how much hated they were by the people. Now, the IRS isn't very popular today. Nobody likes having somebody come and take away their money to collect taxes. But the reason why the Jewish tax collectors were so hated in the days of Jesus was because they weren't collecting taxes for the state of Israel. They weren't collecting taxes for the temple. They were ta collecting taxes for Rome. So they were basically the local agents of the foreign occupying power, simply confiscating the wealth of a subject people. So anyway, so there, it was always a, a, a focal point of tension and as the tensions rose, there was an anti-taxation revolt. And um, uh, you saw, by the way, in, in the uh, Pharisees' attacks on Jesus, when they showed the Roman coin and said, um, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not, trying to get Jesus in trouble. Because, of course, if Jesus said, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, then then he would legitimately be able to be killed by the Roman authorities for trying to promote a taxation revolt. And yet, if he did say, yes, pay your taxes to Caesar, then they could get on their high horses and say, but we ha we ought to have no king but God, right? So anyway, so they were trying to trap him. So you see this kind of role of the subject people having to pay taxes uh, being a theme Actually, in the Old Testament, it's a tremendous theme, but the translations lose it a little bit uh, because we don't have a context for understanding what a vassal state is. Uh, we think of, I think we tend to think of the conquest in the Old Testament like, um, oh, I don't know, when the United States took Puerto Rico from Spain or whatever happened or Texas from Mexico or, you know, those things that, that they're taking territory to incorporate into their realm but it really wasn't about that it was really about taxes so anyway so you had this anti-taxation protest beginning around 66 AD and the Roman governor then uh, responded reciprocated by plundering the treasure in the temple because of course all of the vessels and ornaments were solid gold and so forth so he just went ahead and plundered the second temple claiming all of the precious objects in it for the emperor. And then uh, at the same time, uh, remember the night of the long knives? Maybe not, but in, in uh, under when Hitler came to power in basically one night overnight, he just sent out his henchmen and basically killed all of the opposition leaders. And it's very interesting to read that story because in fact, if you survived until the morning, let's say nine o'clock the next morning, you were home free. It was like a game of tag, you know, where whatever that is, you know, holly, holly, home free if you hit home base. 
uh, if he, they were everyone that they could kill of the of the um, opponents to Hitler, they killed that night. But all you had to do was make it till morning, and the bloodbath was over. And so anyway, it's a good strategy. Sometimes, <laughs> never mind. But sometimes I wish um, <clears throat> that there's some corrupt elements in the U.S. government, and we could have a night of long knives and get rid of the deep state in one fell. Uh, swoop overnight because it would take that right because you leave these infrastructures in place like the deep state and they're like a many headed hydra and you cut off one head and it just pops up somewhere else so you really need to do something like this but anyway I'm getting way ahead of myself or beside myself so anyway the Roman governor did that basically and they, he had a big raid the next day uh, to uh, eliminate all the the tax revolt leaders arresting and, and they were leading Jewish figures so arresting them all and anyway and that then precipitated this wide wide scale rebellion and taking up arms against the Romans and um, it was it was very hard for the Romans to deal with and uh, Nero actually um, commissioned one of his top generals uh, Vespasian um, to go and settle this uh, revolt, which had spread not only from Jerusalem, but also throughout, Ju um, actually, Galilee, the northern kingdom also. And so anyway, the army came and uh, they conquered, actually, Galilee, I believe, relatively quickly. But the, the holdouts for a long time was Jerusalem. Jerusalem had very good walls and so forth and, and good defenses. So the rebel leaders, this, I don't know why I'm going down this rabbit hole so much. Um, but anyway, the rebel leaders from Galilee actually fled to Jerusalem for the protection of the walls. And it was those rebel leaders from Galilee who started a war on the rebel leaders within the walls of Jerusalem already. And there were various um, sects or groups there were the Pharisees uh, and there were the Sadducees, who we remember from the New Testament. And there were also the Zealots. Now, the Zealots, I don't think they explicitly appear by name in the New Testament. Uh, but they were, they were a group that basically wanted to establish, reestablish the Jewish nation through violence, through um, launching war. So anyway, you had those three groups uh, I, uh, in, inside the walls of the old city. Uh, inside the walls of Jerusalem was all the old city. Please forgive me. And uh, they were at each other's throats. So actually, even before the Romans came in, the, supposedly the streets were essentially running with blood from the internecine wars. And the story now, it's hard to trust the history because... The, most of the history we have of what went on in the siege of Jerusalem around 70 AD and the fall of Jerusalem comes from a historian named Josephus. And Josephus was actually a rebel leader in Galilee on the, on the side of the Jews. He was a Jew that um, tried to wage war against the Romans. But when he was captured, he went to work for the Romans. And uh, he basically, yeah, he, he basically joined the Roman side. And then he became a historian. So you can see why the Jews suspect or, or want to suspect his history as being, um, you know, distorted on the pro-Roman side. But, excuse me, that may or may not be true. It's probably not as true as the Jewish side would like to make it out to be. But anyway, so a lot of the history we get comes from Josephus. So maybe it has to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. But basically what he says is, if I remember correctly, that Jerusalem went up in flames. Um, the fire was started actually already inside Jerusalem before the Romans breached the wall by the wars between the sects of Jews within Jerusalem. Another thing that's kind of interesting about the fall of Jerusalem itself at this time is that the um, the Sadducees seemed to be pretty much wiped out during this rebellion. Uh, they were a very small group. There were I, uh, supposedly about only 6,000 of them, but they were the aristocracy. They ran the temple. They ran the uh, sacramental temple priesthood, 
which meant they collected all of the taxes that went to the temple and had the access to all of the sacrifices in the temple. Now, remember, a lot of those sacrifices were, were um, uh, animals, were, were bulls and, and rams and sheep and even pigeons and so forth, which were ritually sacrificed and sometimes uh, burned. But in any case, the meat went to the priests. So it was a tremendous source of wealth simply from getting to um, eat the sacrifices. And anyway, and, and so the Sadducees, uh, being this ruling class, lording it over the people, were disliked to begin with. And their power came from the secular authorities to a large extent because the, I, boy, I keep going down these rabbit holes, but the re, one of the reasons the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection and were not, did not believe in angels, they were very um, secular, so to speak, in their theology or non-spiritual in their theology. And one of the reasons for that was because they had basically, they, were the, they had been Hellenized. In other words, when the Greeks ruled, we're going back a couple of centuries before Christ, the the many of the Jews went over to the Greek side and tried to get along with the Greek ruling powers and kind of assimilate and, you know, kind of get favors from the Greek state, essentially, that ruled everything in those days. And the Sadducees came from that stream. So there were a lot of reasons they weren't popular. And it looks like they were pretty much wiped out during that um period of the siege of Jerusalem. So let me see if there's anything else interesting. This may not be interesting at all, actually, but if any of you have been to Israel, um, and if there are any of you who are Jews or um, are Jews in the church, uh, you've heard of Masada. Masada is a desert fortress that is a huge tourist attraction in Israel for Jewish pilgrims and for Jewish tourists and for Jews in Israel, and for a long time, I don't know if it's still the case, I think it is still the case, uh, Israel has universal military service, and every soldier early on in his military training actually goes to Masada, makes a pilgrimage to Masada. So what was Masada, this fortress on top of a mountain, I would say it's about 100 miles south of Jerusalem in the desert, and it was the last holdout against the Romans during this, I'll call it the 70 AD revolt, the first Jewish re uh, revolt against the Romans. Um, and it took a few years for the Romans to actually successfully uh, break the siege through. In other words, um, they were sieging Masada, but they had uh, food supplies up there and they had water cisterns up there. And it's really on the top of a peak of a mountain, very hard to successfully scale that mountain while you're having things, I don't know what, thrown down on you, arrows shot down on you from above. So it was the last holdout against the Romans. And when they saw that they were about to be taken by the Romans, they actually committed mass suicide to preserve their purity from the various defilements uh, the wh whatever, the rapes of the women and the being taken into slavery and the being tortured and so forth that would happen if they fell into the hands of the Romans. So they actually had this kind of mass suicide pact, um, which makes it an extremely sad place. But anyway, that was the end of the Roman revolt, but really that was just, just symbolic. I do think it's rather tragic that, um, <laughs> never mind, it's kind of tragic that that is a patriotic symbol for the Israelis because it is such intrinsically a sad story and a sad end. And of course, the uh, amb ambiguous morality of committing suicide from the Jewish perspective, that was seen as an act of virtue to keep from uh, ritual defilement, essentially. But from a Catholic perspective or a Christian perspective, there are a whole lot of other uh, moral issues that may overshadow that. So anyway, so uh, one other thing happened during the siege of Jerusalem that may be of interest, and that is that at one point during the siege, one of the leading Pharisee rabbis 
Now, you know, when you think of that, you have to think of more of like a theocracy. I mean, these leading leading rabbis had huge followings around them, maybe numbered in the thousands of students who hang on, hung on their every word. They were sort of like cult leaders or Guru Maharishi, whatever his name was, or so forth. You know, they, they actually, that's not a bad model. They, they were leaders. I don't, the cult, not in the bad sense, but they were religious, charismatic leaders with a cult-like following. There's no question about that. And one of them, a really leading one, Yohan, Yohanan ben Zakai, was smuggled out during the siege. His disciples actually put him in a coffin and smuggled him out, uh, claiming that it was a dead body that they were smuggling out. And when he got out of the siege, he hightailed it to a town about 60 miles away called Yavne. And he basically set up a school there with whatever disciples also escaped or were not trapped in Jerusalem. And that school now... Again, I'm going to get very confusing because the Hebrew name and therefore the Israeli name is Yavne and Christian scholars have started calling it Jamnia, started like 150, 200 years ago, Jamnia, because of just what happens when you take changed languages. You know, look at we, we call the capital of France Paris. You'll never find a French person who calls it Paris. It's Paris, right? So anyway, I, and, and look at, <laughs> I think it's kind of silly, but remember Peking? Are any of you old enough to remember Peking, which now is Beijing, and uh, Bombay, which now is Mumbai? So anyway, you know, the names of places get, um, get distorted when they get moved from one language to another. And so Yavne became Jamnia. So I'll, I'll call it Jamnia. And so this rabbi, Yohanan ben Zakai started a, his school in Jamnia. And after the fall of Jerusalem, that school, that, that settlement there, became the remaining place for Jewish religious study. It became the center of Judaism, like Jerusalem was the center of Judaism before the fall of Jerusalem. Um, Yavne or Jamnia became the center of Jerusalem after the fall of Jerusalem. And then uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you'll hear me later in today's talk, talk a lot about the Council of Jamnia. The reason it's called the Council of Jamnia is because it was being discussed by Christians um, and Christianity is used to church councils, right? We have the Council of Ephesus and the Council of Nicaea and, and so forth. And so it just seemed like a natural terminology to refer to the decisions which were made at essentially the school in Jamnia or that little pharisaical sect that dominated the school at Jamnia. So Christianity kind of started calling it the Council of Jamnia. It wasn't a council. It wasn't like a council that is convened and lasts for six months or two years and comes out with a bunch of documents and establishes dogma. It wasn't that. It was the reigning school for Jewish theology for a long time, like 40 years, 50 years, 80 years, that kind of period of time. Okay, so um, just because... Um, uh, with every show, I'm getting a little better, I think, with the technical aspects. So I just want to use Google Maps to show uh, the um, exodus, so to speak, from Jerusalem to Jamni or Javne. And you see it there. I have a little trouble seeing it because I have a very small screen to work with. But you can see this is contemporary Google Maps. It's only about a 12-hour walk from Jerusalem to Yavne. It's written here on the map, of course, because it's Israel. Uh, Yavne is a pleasant place because it's near the coast. That's the Mediterranean there. So it's a very pleasant place to be. And it was away from the Romans. And it was only, I would say, that makes it a one to two day walk. So that is the relationship between Jerusalem and Yavne or 
or Jamnio. So anyway, I'll get back here. And um, anyway, so that's that. And that is what I guess I was going to say about the Jerusalem revolt, however, and, and the fall of the temple. But I've got to say from the Jewish side, Judaism has never, not only has never recovered from the fall of the temple, but remains fixated on the fall of the temple. Um, the temple in Jerusalem was the dwelling place of God. It was the only way that sacramental Judaism could take place. It was destroyed in a very real sense. There is no real Judaism without the temple. So ever since the fall of the temple, reestablishing the temple has been the heart and soul of Judaism. And every observant Jew prays three times a day for the reestablishment of the temple, the rebuilding of the temple. One of the uh, uh, dogmatic creedal statements, you know, we have the credo in the Catholic Church, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Judaism has a credo too, with 13 articles of faith. And um, one of the articles of faith is a belief in the rebuilding of the temple. It's absolutely at the center of Judaism. Um, I will say that, um, oh, I keep going on side points, uh, but the uh, I'll show a picture of the temple when it existed in Jerusalem. This, of course, is not a photograph of the temple in Jerusalem. It is a reconstruction of it from what we know about it, mostly from, from uh, rules in the Old Testament about it and also contemporaneous descriptions and so forth. You see the Holy of Holies there in the higher building. Now, if you can see, you can see there are a lot of like porticos. There are a lot of, um, of um, arch, you know, covered archways, I guess you'd call them all around and that's where if you remember jesus was giving his instructions during holy week you can imagine him standing there in the shade under one of those uh, porticos you see you all you can see in this picture really is the is the columns holding up the porticos but those are columns and there's a space behind them and like porches and that's where the disciples would gather to hear jesus talk and not only the disciples but hundreds, maybe thousands, actually, of Jews who hung on his words. Remember, he just came in on, on Palm Sunday, you know, Hosanna to the son of David, um, and so forth. So, so anyway, that's another reason for looking at this. So we see that this was the holiest place in Judaism. We see it was the a, a very holy place in Christianity because of Jesus's participation there. And um, it was it was absolutely no one stone was left on top of the other with the destruction of the temple. But there is that tragedy here. But there's another real tragedy here, too, which is uh, and I will go to a contemporary view of the same temple plaza. And of course, it's got actually uh, two Islamic mosques on it. You see. Uh, what's actually the Mosque of Omar, if I have it right, is the smaller dome near the bottom of the screen on the uh, temple platform. And right behind it, you have the Dome of the Rock, which is uh, another Islamic shrine. And there's a, there's a special tragedy, not only to the temple being destroyed, but to it being the, the place, the, the spot of it being taken over by uh, an enemy religion that uh, is a very much an enemy religion of Judaism. Uh, the, there is a, um, uh, there, there are probably, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say hundreds. There are certainly at least dozens of verses in the Quran that talk about the Jews being the worst of all people, the most hated by God, and so forth. And there's even a hadith that's a um, canonical scripture that's not the uh, Quran, which says that the um, day of resurrection won't happen until all the Jews are killed. I mean, the Jews are really the number one enemy of Islam. And um, the Christians are the number two enemy of Islam, because as I, I showed in the last ep um, episode, around the base of the Golden Dome there is this Arabic inscription. There you see the Arabic. 
And what it says is lovely things like, um, I don't know if I can quickly find the, uh, the text here. Yeah, here's the text. Lovely things that are basically curses on Christians. Um, uh, there's no uh, God. Anyway, God has not taken a son and uh, God who has not taken a son and who doesn't have any partner in dominion um, and so forth and so on. Uh, and there are verses that say whoever says that God has a son or that he has partners has indeed committed a great a great sin. As a matter of fact, it's the greatest sin. Actually, the greatest sin in Islam is um, to ascribe to God a partner. Um, I'm tempted to say that is fitna is the Arabic word, but I could have that wrong because I'm flying by the seat of my pants. So anyway, um, or is it shirk? I think it's shirk is the name of that sin, which is the, a greater sin than, you know, mass murder or, or, or anything. So anyway, there was the Jewish temple. So, um, so three times a day, Jews pray for Jerusalem and the resumption of the temple. And um, the holiest place in Judaism, I don't have a picture for it, so I'd better put my own picture up. Uh, the holiest place in Judaism is, of course, the closest the Jews can get to praying um, at the temple, which is praying on the Temple Mount, or, or excuse me, praying at the Western Wall, which is simply the... Um, uh, you can't actually see it in this picture, but maybe you can see it in the Temple Mount Today picture indirectly. You see that the Temple Mount is called the Temple Mount because it's on a raised platform, which is actually built by Herod. And around the raised platform, uh, there is a wall. And actually, the Western Wall, which is actually on the far right-hand side of the screen, you may see a lot of little heads there. That is the Western Wall Plaza. That's the closest that Jews can get even today to where the temple was to pray. So that's where they're all praying. That's the best place in Judaism to pray. That's the holiest place in Judaism. And you can see it's the Western Wall, not of the temple itself, but of the earthworks that were built up to provide a large square platform for the temple. Now, um, I can't point on screen with my technology, so all I can do is ask you to look at the very, 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 very far right side of the screen, the right edge, and you only have maybe an inch, this very small space between that and the uh, wall of the platform. Uh, you know, you see that nice big square platform and you see a little wall that looks thin here, but it isn't thin. And so, and then to the right of that wall, you see a lot of little heads and that's the Temple Mount Plaza. So anyway, um, there you have it. And now I see why you can never move forward in time because I keep going down these rabbit holes or these side points. But okay, Temple Destroyed. I'm, I'm glad I showed that picture though because it's almost impossible for a non-Jew to identify with with how important this is um, in Judaism. And by the way, it's not important in Islam. They call it the third holiest place in Islam today, Jerusalem, because it's part of the imperialism to be able to get world opinion to support their claims to it and so forth. But in fact, it's not mentioned. Jerusalem isn't mentioned at all in the Quran. Um, Muhammad mentioned it a little bit only when he was uh, trying to recruit Jews to become Muslims. And it's only holiness within Islam today is associated with a, a mythical place called the farthest mosque. The farthest mosque is, uh, is named in the Quran. There's a reference to the farthest mosque. Islam today likes to claim that the farthest mosque was a mosque on top of the Temple Mount. Um, which is rather difficult to believe since the Temple Mount was not in Muslim hands at the time. Uh, but in any case, the story in the Quran is that one night Muhammad boarded, you know, mounted his magical steed, which had wings, which flew him 
from uh, where he was, I don't remember whether it was Mecca or Medina, to the farthest mosque. And he, um, I keep forgetting the names, but he tied up his horse at the foot of the uh, Western Wall, I believe. And he flew up to heaven. I'm not sure where he tied up his horse. But anyway, he tied up his horse. Did he tie up his horse? Never mind. I forgot about tying up his horse. But in any case, he flew up to heaven from the farthest mosque. I think he flew up to heaven maybe on the same horse. That's why I'm getting confused. But he flew up to heaven from the farthest mosque. Now, there's no reference at all in the Quran about where this farthest mosque was, except that it was the farthest mosque and no association with Jerusalem at all. But later on, it became convenient to claim that the farthest mosque was in fact the top of the Temple Mount. And that is the claim to holiness. That's the only claim to holiness that this site has in Islam. But nonetheless, nevertheless, they have successfully used it as a hammer to establish full sovereignty over it and forbid Jews and Christians from praying there or even visiting it because it is so holy to Islam. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, okay, so that's that. Now, let's get to the period between uh, 70 AD and about 130 AD or... Um, no, I can't get there yet. <laughs> oh boy, I'm, I may not, not get past 70 AD on this whole show. We'll have to see. Um, let me see if there's anything wrong about the time, uh, about the voice or something. Um, but anyway, okay. Now, what was the day that the temple was destroyed? The temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. The Jews certainly remember what the day was. It was the, to this day, the central event in Judaism by, in the, by their perspective. By our perspective, we know the central event in Judaism was either the birth of Christ or the crucifixion. But from their perspective, the central event in Judaism was the destruction of the temple. So they, of course, remember when it was. And it was the ninth day of Av. Uh, Av being a month on the Jewish calendar, which generally falls around August or September. The Jewish calendar can't be translated directly into our calendar because our calendar has 365 days most years, occasionally has 366 days for leap years. Uh, it is closely tied to the sun. The Jewish calendar is more closely tied to the moon. It's called the lunar calendar. Ours is called the solar calendar. Um, if you, you know, um, lunar months, lunar cycles do not fit neatly into the year, right? A lunar cycle is about 30 days. And so you can have 12 lunar cycles, but that's only 360 days. It's not 365 days. So you have to periodically make an adjustment to get the lunar cycle to be um, synchronized again with the sun's cycle. And so the Jewish months drift around a little bit and every so often they get corrected by the addition of an extra month to make up for those five missing days. By the way, the Islamic calendar does not have any correction. And so if I remember correctly, the dates, the, the Islamic holidays like Ramadan, they drift throughout the entire year. There's no synchronization done with the solar calendar. So Ramadan can be in December, it can be in March, it can be in August, it can be in September, it can be any time. The Jewish dates only drift about six or eight weeks at the most. I think it's probably less than that, about six weeks. Uh, and then they get corrected by the addition of the extra month, whatever it is, every six years or so. Anyway, okay, so that's that, in case you're interested. That's also why the, um, although Passover falls, no, I can't say that. Uh, I can't say that about Passover. It's why, for instance, the Jewish high holidays uh, sometimes fall in the beginning of September, sometimes fall in the beginning of October, and so forth. Anyway, the ninth day of Av generally falls in August, or it always falls in August or September. So this ninth day of Av, ninth day of Av, is the biggest day in 
uh, I mean, the, 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 the biggest event in Jewish history happened on the ninth day of Av. Now, what's very interesting from a spiritual point of view is that all of the great disasters of Judaism occurred on the ninth of Av, or within a day of the ninth of Av, to be fully honest. And it is absolutely amazing. Now, I don't think this is superstition, and I don't think it's legend. I think it's because, as I've said on previous shows, God is God. So he actually writes his poetry, his novel, his beautiful work of art. He writes it with human history. A novelist makes up all these coincidences, right? To make this like poetic echoes in his novel or, you know, you can think of, I don't know, Dostoevsky or these great novelists or poets. And, you know, they, they get to make up things to have tremendous coincidences and echoes so that um, uh, I'm thinking of the movie, the, the Citizen Kane. But, you know, so on the same day that something happens 30 years later, it gets fulfilled and stuff like that. But it's fiction, so they can make it up as fiction. God can make it up in reality because he weaves human destiny through divine providence. So let's look at the things that happened on Tisha B'Av. That's just Hebrew for the ninth day of Av. So let me pull up that slide. Okay. So here are the disasters that befell the Jewish people. Some of them are of less interest to us than others. On the same day on the Jewish calendar, the ninth day of Av, the first and another huge disaster was the, um, okay, you remember the story of the Exodus from Egypt? The uh, Jews fled the Pharaoh's power in Egypt. They crossed the waters of the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. And they spent 40 gall darn years wandering through the desert on the way to the promised land okay they spent 40 years getting to israel from egypt well in fact it's not a very long walk um it's maybe uh, i'll show up a pull up a slide it could probably be done in 10 days it certainly could be done in two months quite easily um they spent 40 years why did they spend 40 years well they uh, granted they spent two years almost two years getting to the jordan river from egypt okay so that was already a lot of wandering you know the story that um they would uh make an encampment in the desert um there would be a cloud uh, a, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day that would lead them to where they were to go next and then it would be stationary there and they would stay there in an encampment until the cloud told them to move. So that cloud, basically, when it led them from Egypt to the Jordan River, to essentially right across the Jordan River, you could say from Jerusalem. I'll show you that on a map. Um, that, uh, okay, the, that cloud took them two years to get there. Okay, so yeah, that's already a long time. And you, when you follow their route, they did not take the direct route at all. So, okay, so that was um, two years. But then what happened? Then what happened when they got to the borders of the Holy Land, um, Moses sent in 12 spies from the 12 tribes of Israel to scout out the Holy Land before they all entered to see if it was safe to enter, to see what kind of warfare they would be facing. And of those 12 tri spies, 10 came back saying, Oy vey, there's no way we could ever get there. I'm all, only on the first of the disasters, okay? So I'm going to get my face back up here. Um, Oy vey, the, the people are as big as giants. Um, there's no way we could conquer them. Uh, you know, it's, you know we, we have to give up. Granted, two of the spies came back and said, let's have faith in the Lord our God. We can do anything with him on our side. But the other 10 discouraged the Israeli, the Jewish people, and they did not have the guts, the chutzpah, to enter the Holy Land. Um, what the spies said, I have a quote in front of me. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we were like grasshoppers. <laughs> okay, so that's what they said. So, of course, the uh, Jewish people did not have the nerve to enter the Holy Land. They did not trust in God. 
and God punished them for their infidelity and said, because you did not believe in my word, none of you are worthy to enter the Holy Land. So you're going to stay stuck in this desert until basically everyone who's alive, this entire generation, passes away. So only the next generation will deserve to enter the Holy Land. That was the next 38 years, okay? So that's why they spent 40 years in the desert, was because of um, the 12, I'll pull that up again, the first of the disasters that happened on this magical day of disasters, the Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, was the 12, tri the 12 spies returning in despair from their spying. Now, Tisha B'Av, to this day, is a fast day, uh, like Yom Kippur. Uh, it's a very mournful fast day. Uh, it's, the fast is about 25, 26 hours without water. Uh, the Jewish fasts are from sundown the day before until full dark the day after. That's why they're longer than 24 hours. And they don't allow uh, any number of things, including water um, or eating or drinking of any sort. Uh, they don't allow marital relations, for instance, or other things they don't allow. But anyway, so it's a, a day of really severe mourning. Now, let me show you the route through the desert that uh, took them 40 years. And again, this is now Google Maps. So it actually shows, I'm not sure I'll be able to see it here. I may have to change my screen to be able to uh, get a big enough picture to see what it says. Oops. Um, uh, that does not work. I have to go back to my other screen and I'm not sure I'll be able to read it, but you'll be able to see that I believe it says, um, what about a 60 hour walk? Uh, I believe it says about, about maybe, what is it? Two, 200 miles or so. Let me see if I can, um, catch sight of it now. I think now I can see. Yes. Yeah, so it says 62 hours walk or 308 kilometers, which is 200 miles from, uh, that's actually where the Jews started, that, that little, that little uh, pin there in Egypt. It says Tel El Dab, Dabs or something. Anyway, that, that's essentially where um, the Jews um, crossed, the, um, crossed the Red Sea. Or no, that's where they started. I guess they made it up to the, the Red Sea. Well, they didn't take the route on the map, so never mind. Never mind. They started there. They dropped down to the Red Sea. They went up again. They went around in circles and stuff. Remember, they took two years to make it to, um, you see Jerusalem there and uh, you see, I uh, don't go quite far enough, but you see the little pin of Jerusalem. And if you go a little bit to the right of it and down, I think you would find Jericho, which isn't a big enough town to be on the map. But in any case, so figure that um, instead of being that 300 kilometers, it would be uh, another 200 kilometers at most to get to Jerusalem by way of um, Jericho. So 500, kilo 500 kilometers, that's 300 miles, you know, at, at uh, three miles a day, that's 100 days, right? But it took them 40 years. I just wanted to give you a sense of the actual geography because, of course, when you read the Old Testament, you might think, you know, it's like walking, you know, that, that 40 years was a reasonable amount of time or 10 years was a reasonable amount of time. It wasn't a reasonable amount of time. One, one could do it even on the circuitous route that they took in a matter of weeks or a couple of months. So anyway, that is that. So, um, so that was the first disaster that happened on uh, Tisha B'Av. And so I'll, I guess I'd better um, get back to the um, Tisha B'Av slide. And um, the next disaster that happened was what we saw, uh, you know, 10 minutes ago, which was the first temple destroyed. And of course, when the temp first temple was destroyed, it wasn't only the destruction of the temple, it was the beginning of the Babylonian exile. Um, which, um, I mean, there are lots of Psalms, you know, about 
about hanging up their harps beside the rivers of Babylon and, and weeping over, you know, being in Babylon, weeping over their exile from Jerusalem and so forth. I don't think it lasted that long. If my memory serves me, it lasted about 73 years, maybe, that comes, kind, comes to mind, but that kind of a period. But it was, you know, it was the most heartbreaking thing in, it's one of the most heartbreaking things still in Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, in Judaism. And in fact, the music behind the opening slide that if you tuned in early, you heard was the Lamentations of Jeremiah. And the reason I was playing that is because those were Lamentations over the destruction of Jerusalem, which were sung by the prophet Jeremiah during the Babylonian exile. So there's actually a method to my madness. So anyway, so that was the second thing that uh, happened on the Tisha B'Av. Now, the third thing that happened, we haven't gotten to yet today. So I'll have to talk about that. So first, talk, I, I did talk a little bit. The period between 70 AD and about 130 AD, you had the heart of religious Judaism in Jamnia. You had uh, the Pharisees, by and large, having moved to uh, the leading rabbis of the Pharisees, certainly to Jamnia, to participate in that theological school. You had some Jews that were still living in Jerusalem or returned to Jerusalem after the Roman destruction and tried to somehow survive there and so forth. Anyway, so you just have this interregnum, this period of, of um, whatever that would have been, about 60 years. And then you have the next great disaster to befall Judaism, which also has a theological component. Let me um, just pull up, okay, pull up the chat screen there so I see what's going on there. Um, Okay, the second great disaster, and in a sense, I don't want to say a worse disaster, but an equally significant disaster, was the second Jewish revolt, right? Because we are stubborn and hard-hearted people. You know, it's hard to, you know, for us to take a hint. So the first revolt against Rome, which failed so miserably, wasn't enough for the stubborn and hard-hearted Jewish people. They had to launch a second revolt around 130 AD. So uh, let me tell the story of the second revolt. And the reason I got tied in knots a little bit about the first revolt was I momentarily lost my thread about whether I was talking about the first revolt or the second revolt. Now, the second revolt is super interesting for Jewish Catholics like me or Jewish Christians because the second revolt is called the Bar Kokhba revolt. Now, why is it called the Bar Kokhba revolt? is because the leader of the Second Revolt was a successful contender to be considered the Messiah for the Jewish nation. Okay, And this has huge implications for the relation between Christianity and Judaism. So you thought I was just talking about things that was not of any interest at all to people who weren't Jewish fanatics. But in fact, I hope you'll see there really is the theological, huge theological implications, all of this stuff. So, who was Bar Kokhba? Bar Kokhba was a pretender to be the Messiah. Uh, he claimed he was the Messiah. His name at birth was not Bar Kokhba, it was Shimon ben Koziba. But uh, he was uh, given the name Bar Kokhba when he was accepted as the Messiah by basically the school of rabbis at Jamnia. In other words, the entire rabbinical authority, the theocracy of Judaism, led by Rabbi Akiba, who was the foremost, I mean, even today, Rabbi Akiba is a legendary authority in Judaism, literally. And he threw his weight behind Bar Kokhba and said, yes, Bar Kokhba is in fact the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And I believe he actually dubbed him with the name Bar Kokhba, which means son of the star. And it's a reference to, um, yes, he did. He's the one who gave him the name Bar Kokhba. And it's a reference to the messianic prophecy in Numbers, there shall come a star out of Jacob, 
which was the prophecy of the Messiah coming from the line of David. I believe, I believe it was the prophecy that Jacob um, gave uh, to the 12 sons, so to speak, uh, from his deathbed. But be that as it may, it was a, prof a messianic prophecy from Numbers. And uh, um, yeah, I'm always in trouble when I fly by the seat of my pants. So, so don't hold me to that. But it was a prophecy, a messianic prophecy from the book of Numbers. Exactly who gave it when, I um, don't want to don't want to be fast and loose with. In any case, that prophecy said there shall come a star out of Jacob. And this was always understood in Judaism to be a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And so when Rabbi Akiba changed uh, Shimon ben Koziba's name to Bar Kokhba, he was saying... He is the Messiah, and he said he is the Messiah, and he gave him the name, you know, Star of Jacob, to make it clear that he was the Messiah. Now, even the Jews realize today that Bar Kokhba was not the Messiah, okay? Because they're still waiting for the Messiah, and Bar Kokhba lost the revolt, and it was one of the, it's probably the second greatest tragedy that ever befell Judaism, was the failed Bar Kokhba revolt, Okay. Now, why is this an object of so much humor for me? The reason is because, remember, it was the Council of Jamnia, let's say, that crowned Bar Kokhba as the Messiah, that threw its weight behind Bar Kokhba as the Messiah and said, Bar Kokhba is the Messiah. It was the very same Council of Jamnia that formally excommunicated Christians Jewish Christians, Jews who had actually entered the church, until then still went to synagogue, apparently. I don't know how many details I'm going to give about this, because I could give a whole show probably about this. But until the Council of Jamnia, let's say, whenever it was, about 90 AD, until this assembly of the all of the Pharisee theological leaders at the Council of Jamnia, Jews who had entered the church were still going to the synagogue. They were going to Mass on Sunday, um, but they were also still participating in synagogue worship. They were formally excommunicated only by the Council of Jamnia. So think of the irony. They were formally excommunicated for having been followers of a false messiah. So think of the irony that the same council that formally excommunicated Jews who believed in Jesus for having followed a false messiah threw its entire weight before be, behind a genuinely false messiah. So I am actually excommunicated as a Jew for following a false messiah by people who followed a false messiah. Okay, so you see the humor of that. Anyway, the way they excommunicated the Jews was by introducing a curse in the synagogue service. Um, that curse is the Birkat Haminim, which means the blessing on the heretics. And let me pull that up uh, in, in English here. You see, I love my new toy that lets me show slides on my shows. You'll have to let me know whether they're a distraction, whether you enjoy. So here's the blessing, which is said at this every synagogue service. OK, so the idea was that if this curse was said, out loud at the synagogue service and the entire congregation had to say amen, then of course any uh, believer in Jesus who was there couldn't say amen, so he would be thrown out. He would identify himself and he wouldn't want to be there because of this curse. So here is the curse. For the apostates, now this refers to a very special kind of apostate and you'll see why that's very clear but it, uh, uh, it uh, applies to Jews who became followers of Jesus who, or who are followers of Jesus. That's what the apostate word means. So for the, follower, the Jewish followers of Jesus, for the apostates, let there be no hope and let the arrogant government or authority, in other words, Christianity, be speedily uprooted in our days. It really means let the church be speedily uprooted in our days. Let the Nozarim. Now, this is why it becomes so clear, because the earlier word, minim, 
refers to apostates. Now, everyone really knows it meant Christians or rather Jewish Christians. But in case there was any confusion, the next time they're referred to, they're referred to as Nazarenes. Nazarene is a Hebrew version of Nazarene, okay? Because Jesus was from Nazareth. The early Christians, before they were called Christians even, were called Nazarenes, okay? So let the Nazarenes and the apostates be destroyed in a moment and let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be inscribed together with the righteous. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who humbles the arrogant. Okay, so that's the Birkat Haminim. It's still said in the synagogue. Um, I have a friend who's a very noble-hearted Orthodox Jew who started a movement to try to get the curse removed after 2,000 years. Uh, he's a very sweet man. He's a brilliant scientist and archaeologist, but that's going neither here nor there. Anyway, so there is a little bit of a movement, a one-man movement, to remove that curse. But um, that is the curse that was instituted by the very same people that crowned uh, Bar Kokhba as the genuine Messiah. And let me show you that in Hebrew. I don't know why, just because it's fun. And because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a text from an old prayer book. You can see it's an old prayer book. Um, you can actually see something else here, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, now, I can't point, unfortunately. Someday I'll be able to point to things on the screen. But if you look at the very last line of Hebrew text near the bottom, and you look at the word in the middle, it's the third word in from the right. Hebrew gets read from right to left, but it doesn't matter because the third in word in from the left also. And you can see it's written really weird. You have the Hebrew letters on all of the other, the rest of the text. And here in that word, remember it's read from right to left. The first three letters are normal full-size letters. And then it's like open brackets and they're tiny little letters, right? Now, the reason for that is because the word there in the Hebrew is the tetragamon it's the word the unpronounceable name of god yod he vav he or y h w h you know that christians say sometimes they say yahweh sometimes they say jehovah but jews i do not want to pronounce the name of god lest they be saying you know one of the ten commandments thou shalt not take my name in vain so instead they say the word lord Adonai, which simply means Lord, as a circumlocution, as a substitution, so that everyone knows what the name there is, but no one has to say it because they say Adonai instead. This is unfortunate for people who read, uh, for Christians actually, or for anyone who, you know, reads the Bible in English or uh, the Psalms in English, because Sometimes Lord, if you look at the Psalms in English, sometimes Lord will be all in caps, in which case it means the unpronounceable name of God, the, the Y-H-W-H. And sometimes they'll just be capital L, little O-R-D, in which case it's literally the word Adonai, which just means Lord. So you have in Psalms verses that make no sense, well, not a lot of sense, like the Lord said to my Lord. It's much clearer if you're looking at the Hebrew and you see that one of those instances is the proper name of God, the, the name that God gave to Moses when Moses said, who shall I say, you know, spoke to me, you know, and, and the burning bush said, tell them, you know, why HWH spoke to you. I am that I am. I guess it's usually translated. I am that which is. Um, by the way, <laughs> another digression, my wife is a philosophy professor, so I'm not much of a philosopher, but I thought it was incredibly cool, which is the following, which is that, you know, Thomistic philosophy, meaning Catholic philosophy, actually, you know, I casually say that God created everything that exists. My wife corrects me and says, you can't say that. You have to say, God created contingent being because there are two forms of being. There's contingent being, which exists because it was created. And there's non-contingent being, 
which was never created and never, never was. In other words, it never, never was. <laughs> it's hard to talk about this stuff. Okay. But the philosopher's term for that and the Thomist term for that is non-contingent being. So all you can say is that God created contingent being, but God is non-contingent being. Now, if you wanted to, in shorthand, say non-contingent being to Moses 4,000 years ago or 3,500 years ago, you know, it would be pretty clever to say, I am who am. I am who am. In other words, I am the one whose existence is self-contained. Isn't that cool? I think that's incredibly cool. So anyway, so that unpronounceable name of God, that yod Hey vav Hey, um, I know a very serious Hebrew scholar who's a Christian who says that a better translation of that um, YW V uh, YW I have trouble in English yod Hey vav Hey the Tetragamon would be I am that is I am that was and I am that ever will be in other words you actually have compressed within those four letters the present tense of to be the past tense of to be and the future tense of to be you actually have all of the modalities of to be um, even the conditional and the um, subjunctive this gets into a complicated issue of Hebrew grammar but believe me this um, Hebrew scholar is probably the foremost living Christian scholar of Hebrew grammar and anyway his his assertion is that that yod hey vav hey that tetragamon that uh, Yahweh if you want to pronounce it is wraps together all of the tenses of the verb to be so it's even better than I am he who is or I am that am it's even better than that I am that am I am that will be I am that always was I am that would be could be must be shall be um, you know and so forth and so on his essence is existence I see that um, one of the uh, chats says Thank you for bearing with me. So anyway, so there you have them trying to actually write it out in the prayer book so no one makes the mistake of pronouncing it out loud. And when I was, you know, a bright-eyed little eight-year-old going to a Hebrew religious education after school and reading passages from the Bible and trying to learn to read Hebrew, I, like all of my classmates, was terrified that I would accidentally pronounce the word and not realize that it was the word I wasn't supposed to pronounce. We did not have this cute little system there of the little letters underneath telling you not to pronounce it, but to pronounce Adonai instead. But I certainly wished I had. Okay, just so you know that I'm still here, I'll pull me up for a moment. There we have it. And, um, and uh, now... I'm still on the Bar Kokhba revolt. I'm not going to get past the Bar Kokhba revolt today. I, I can't. Oh, there's the time. I've been talking for an hour and a quarter. I, I'm not going to get past the Bar Kokhba revolt. I hope I get to the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Um, okay. So let me show you a picture of um, Bar Kokhba. That is not really a picture of Bar Kokhba, of course, but it is an icon of Bar Kokhba, so to speak of Jewish origin because of course it shows you what the Jews at least the Jews of the Council of Jamnia were hoping for in a Messiah okay so there's Bar Kokhba, Bar Kokhba riding his horse carrying the shield of David you know with the six pointed stars you know with his blazing sword with his soldiers alongside him with his mighty steed you know ready to defeat the Romans. So that is the, it's embarrassing, isn't it? That's the Messiah they were looking for instead of our beloved Jesus. 
Uh, anyway, what a tragedy. So uh, let me see. Oh, by the way, Bar Kokhba's revolt was not entirely unsuccessful. It was actually successful for about three years. Let me take a drink, excuse me. And he ruled. He ruled Jerusalem as the secular leader. Um, he was the king, let's say. He was actually called the prince. His title was Prince Nasi. Um, that's N-A-S-I, not N-A-Z-I. It just means uh, prince in Hebrew. So let me um, let me find do 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 do. Um, uh, boy, okay, here here we have it. And when he was ruling Jerusalem, there were coins minted, a coins minted that celebrated the new Jewish kingdom with their new prince Bar Kokhba. And here we have you can buy these coins; they're horribly expensive. And I don't know how you know whether they're a counterfeit or not. I guess. I guess there are people who can tell, but um, uh, I think I think about three thousand dollars can get you within uh, shooting distance of one, and uh, I don't know what condition that would be. But here you have a picture of the coin front and back, and um, I can't read that funny version of Hebrew text. Um, I believe I know that some of them say Bar Kokhba, others of them just have Jewish symbols. Now, this, this big bunch of grapes is a Jewish symbol, of course, from the time when the Jews first tried to enter Israel, you know, when they were stopped at the Jordan River and the, you know, the, the first disaster of the Tisha B'Av when the spies came back and said they came back carrying a, a bunch of grapes that was so big they had to carry it on a pole between the shoulders of two of them you know, hanging down because it was such a huge thing. And um, so, so that bunch of grapes would be a reference to the promised land and the, you know, milk and honey and richness of the promised land, which presumably um, during this short period when Bar Kokhba was victorious, the Jews thought they had regained. So that would be the story behind that bunch of grapes, although that's somewhat speculative on my part. So anyway, so there you have the Bar Kokhba revolt. Now, what, what precipitated the Bar Kokhba revolt was that, and this is actually, all of this stuff actually has a relevance, um, at least in my brain. Um, but I should have, maybe has some interest to Christians. I don't know. It certainly has a relevance to politics today. So I'll get into the politics today uh, at this point. Okay, what, what started this revolt was in 130 AD, Hadrian, the uh, Roman Emperor, planned to rebuild Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was in smoldering ruin, ruins since 70 AD. I mean, I'm sure there were Jews living there in, you know, in, in hovels or in tents or whatever. But it was essentially, you know, just, uh, just a total, you know, destruction site. And uh, in 130 AD, Hadrian had the wonderful idea to rebuild it as a great city. And actually, it's a good location for a great city, I believe, uh, because of trade routes and so forth. It's not a bad place to um, have a regional capital. It's also quite defensible, by the way, because of the way it's on a mountaintop and so forth. So anyway, it was there's a reason why it was a city from, you know, eons, you know, from prehistory. And Hadrian decided to rebuild it as a provincial capital of the Roman Empire. And as a side benefit, of course, he got to name it after himself. So he was going to name the new city Aelia Capitolina, uh, Hadrian's uh, secular name, so to speak, as opposed to his name as emperor, was Aelius, uh, A-E-L-I-U-S. So um, he was going to name it Aelia, which means, you know, you know like Hadrian's or you know, his secular names, aliases, Capitolina, which um, uh, meant that it, this, the city would be dedicated to Jupiter, the god Jupiter. Because um, I, if I understand this business right, Jupiter's title, so to speak, was Jupiter Capitolinus, because he, of course he was the chief god. So Hadrian was going to rebuild it 
the city as this provincial capital, Aelia Capitolinus. And it was going to be dedicated to the god Jupiter, or the god Zeus, of course, which is the Greek name for the same god Jupiter. And, of course, if the city is going to be dedicated to god Jupiter, the centerpiece has to be a temple of Jupiter. And where in Jerusalem would you build a temple to Jerusalem to Jupiter? Where would be a fitting place but the Temple Mount, of course, where the Jewish temple had been. So Hadrian's plan was to rebuild Jerusalem as a Roman capital city, to rename it Aelia Capitolinus to honor him, Hadrian, who, by the way, was a god also, since the Roman emperors were gods, and, of course, the king of gods, Jupiter Capitolinus, and build a magnificent temple to Jupiter where the Jewish temple was. Now, this did not go over well with the Jews. So this is actually what precipitated the disastrous Bar Kokhba revolt when they found out that Hadrian was planning to build a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. Now, <laughs> now I'm going to get just a little bit political. I, some of you may actually unsubscribe me. I'm, I'm very sorry if that happens. Um, I'm very sorry if that happens, and I'm going to try to be as charitable as I can possibly be. But we've all heard of the Palestinians, and we've all heard of the Palestinian people, and we've all heard of the country Palestine, and we've all know the name Palestine. And we think that Palestine was the name for that territory around Jerusalem, for what's now Israel, that area of the Middle East, we think it was a name for that area which somehow predates the Jewish presence there. Um, that it kind of belonged to the Palestinians before it was, you know, Abraham showed up and took it for the Jews or whatever. And that it was the original name of the area or something along those lines. Um, well, here's the true story and you'll never find a history anywhere, I'm sure, even in Wikipedia that contests the following, which is that area of the world was never called Palestine until this period around 130 AD. Remember, this is after it had been the capital of the Jew Jewish nation. It has, is after the first temple was built in you know, 587 BC. No, it was destroyed in 587 BC, excuse me. So it was probably built around 700 BC. Um, that's before Christ. And then the Jews returned in whatever, about 500 BC, and they uh, rebuilt the temple in 500 BC that was then finally destroyed in 70 AD. And it was the capital of the Jewish nation all that period. And there never was a name Palestine associated with that territory. Uh, it was, uh, you know, referred to as Israel. It was referred to as Judea. Uh, I'm sure it had other names. Um, you know, names associated like Galilee. I don't know where the name Galilee comes from, but it obviously had the name Galilee in those days. But it was never called Palestine. The The name Palestine was invented by the Romans around this period of 130 AD. They were going to rebuild Jerusalem and rename Jerusalem Aelia Capitolinus to eradicate all memory of the Jewish state. So they had to have a name to eradicate all memory of the Jewish state. Judea wouldn't do for a name, right? Because Judea, it's the Jews, it's the tribe of Judah. So they picked the name Palestine. Where did they get the name Palestine? Well, if you read the Old Testament, you'll see that the most antagonistic enemy of the Jews were the Philistines. Remember the story of Samson and the Philistines, you know, in, in, you know, Anyway, the Philistines were essentially the most hostile tribe to the Jews. The Jews were a tribe too, right? The Philistines were their, their worst mortal enemies. So the Romans, in order to insult the Jews and to put their stamp of sovereignty over the place and humiliate the Jewish history of the place, chose the name Palestine as a form of Philistines, not because it was Philistine territory. Uh, Philistine territory, I believe, was in Gaza, was, was quite far away. Um, I'm almost sure it was in Gaza, as a matter of fact. 
But um, anyway, just to humiliate the Jews. So that is the first introduction of the name Palestine. Okay. Now, since it was um, a Roman colony, and um, that name Palestine for the geographic region that was introduced about 130 AD, uh, you know, the, uh, in this attempt to wipe out the Jewish history of the place, um, that name Palestine kind of st stuck for the geographic region. It was never a country. It was a province of Rome. And then it was a, uh, it was southern Syria. It was a terror, it was a geographic area. And for most of the 2000 years or so, or whatever is 1800 years between 130 AD and 1968 AD. Well, I shouldn't go up to 1968 AD. I'll go up to about 18, no, 1914, actually AD. For most of that period, it was a geographic region within the Cal, well, you know, everything I say, you know, I, I'm not actually giving a history lesson, okay? And, and so I, I'm talking in a way imprecisely or incorrectly. But in any case, it was a, you can think of it as a geographic region within the Persian Empire. You can think of it as a geographic region within the uh, um, Seleucid? No, never mind. I don't want to guess. But within the Persian Empire, within the um, Muslim Empire, and then finally within the Ottoman Empire, it was a geographic region. It wasn't a country. Uh, those empires didn't have countries, and they didn't have uh, populations associated with geographic regions. Those empires had huge territories, and they had tribes. And they had tribes that sometimes stayed in one part of the territory. They had tribes that sometimes moved or they had nomadic tribes that were always on the move. And they were always um, loyal to, sometimes of course they revolted, but they were generally loyal to the ruling empire over them. So anyway, Palestine was a region, a geographic region of other empires um, that first were Persian, and then when uh, Persia fell to the Muslims, essentially, became part of the Caliphate or part of the Muslim Empire. And then when the uh, Crusaders, of course, took back Jerusalem for a short period, it was part of the Crusader Empire that didn't last long and so forth. But it was a geographic region. Like Brook well, Brooklyn is a little bit of a government, so that's not fair to say. Like the Midwest or like the Southwest, or like, um, you know, the Pacific Coast. These are geographic regions within, within the United States, right? The, the Rocky Mountains. They don't have any civil authority. They don't have any native population that, you know, is an identity. I suppose Midwesterners might, have, might probably think of themselves as Midwesterners. Um, so there might be a little overlap there, but they were never countries and they were never nationalities and so forth. And, um, and so that's what Palestine was for all of that time. And in fact, there wasn't ever a concept of a Palestinian people. I'm not making this up until Yasser Arafat came along or until the 1960s. And um, maybe I'll do another show on it. I think I have done a show. I don't know if I've done a live. I haven't done a live stream I don't know if I have a video show on the um, history of the Middle East. Um, I know I have a YouTube video, but it might only be audio on the history of the region. And I'm not going to go into it too much now because that's not the topic of today's talk, which is why I never get to the end. But um, the, um, the, ethnic, the ethnic identity of the Palestinian people today is not only totally indistinguishable, from the ethnic identity of Egyptians and Jordanians. But the most common last names among the Palestinian people tend to be reference of their references to where they come from. And the, the city names where they come from tend to be cities in Egypt. So, um, so they, your, their ethnic identity is actually in their name 
as coming from there. And the almost none of them trace their uh, family tree to that geographic re geographic region that's now Israel or the Palestinian territories or whatever you want to call it till uh, before the second half of the 19th century, actually until before the 1880s. Because what happened in around then, 1860s on you maybe, the Zionist movement began and um, Jews started moving to that unoccupied area and it really wasn't occupied. I have pictures of the area. Mark Twain was a tourist and toured the area in about the 1860s. And he said, basically, you know, he, you could ride for days and come across one person, two people, you know, nomads. Um, it was totally uninhabited, essentially, most of that region. Jerusalem always had a small population, which was mixed between like dozens and dozens of ethnic groups, including a lot of Christians, by the way, Christians of all kinds of sects, because of course, Jesus being there, Jews, some Arabs and so forth. Um, anyway, but what happened then with the rise of Zionism in the second half of the 19th century was there was an influx of Jews, mostly from Eastern Europe, but also from Western Europe, and um, also wealthy Jews, some of whom didn't actually move there, like the Rothschilds, funded the Zionist movement. So they basically provided funds for these Jews who were willing to move to this uninhabited territory. And so you had all of these uh, European Jews and Russian Jews that came there and planted vineyards and built buildings and restored things and so forth and actually drained swamps. And therefore, they had a need for a lot of manual labor. They provided manual labor. This isn't like they were all overlords. But all of a sudden, there was all of this economic activity in the area. And so a lot of Arabs were extremely poor. They were subsistence nomads, essentially, very many of them, you know, just living off of the milk from their goats and so forth. And all of a sudden, you had all of this money flowing in to drain swamps, to plant vineyards, to build buildings. So there was a large influx of um nomadic Arab labor or of Arab labor, laborers who were drawn by the Jewish money, essentially, or the money that was being spent by the Jewish immigrants. And so you do have a, a lot of these families, not as many as one might think, but these families that date back to the 1880s or 1890s or 1900s or, you know, that came there then. But most of them have names, uh, if they've maintained their original names, that show that they come from somewhere else. And in fact, Yasser Arafat, who started the Palestinian national movement, you could say, in the 1960s, um, he grew up in Cairo, and his family was from Cairo. I believe he was born and raised in Cairo. There's some possibility that that might not be true, um, you know, because, of course, there's a lot of politics around that. So I wouldn't bet my life that he was born in Cairo, although I think he was born in Cairo. But I don't want to say that my life, but I am 100% sure that he was raised in Cairo because we know where he was raised. He was raised in his uncle's house and we know who his uncle was and so forth. And we know that his family was from Cairo. So that we know for sure. So that is your poster boy for the Palestinians right there. And by the way, the concept for the uh, Palestinian state and the concept for the PLO actually came from Moscow and came from, now I'm going to sound like a tin hat conspiracy theorist, but Yasser Arafat was trained by Moscow and he periodically went to meet with his Moscow masters um, in Romania because um, Romania was, of course, under the Soviet Union in those days but there were fewer foreign eyes noting what took place in Romania than would note what took place in Russia or in Moscow. So his KGB handlers would go to Romania and Yasser Arafat would meet them in Romania and get his directions and, you know what I mean, his, his, his uh, you know, debriefing and his briefing and so forth. And we know this, and this isn't a, you know, tin hat conspiracy theory, 
because the head of the KGB for Romania defected to the West. His name was uh, Pachipa. I forgot his first name at the moment. I think it was Mikhail Pachipa, but I'm not 100% sure. And he wrote his memoirs, of which I have a copy. I strongly recommend them. I think they're called Red Horizon. And he would listen in because, of course, every hotel room was bugged and everything. So, so anyway, he would be listening in to... Um, because he was only the head of the Romanian KGB, so he wasn't like the KGB agent who was briefing Yasser Arafat and getting briefed by Arafat and so forth. But he was the head of the Romanian KGB, so he was the person who bugged the hotel room where all of this was going on. And it's extremely entertaining to hear what went on in that hotel room, excuse me, besides the um, briefings. But he talks about, of course, the substance of what I'm saying too. So we have an eyewitness, or at least an ear witness. And he's also an ear witness to, uh, I won't go into details, but to Yasser Arafat's sexual depravity, which was really gross and really a big part of his activity, or I don't know how to put it, but he was very passionate about it. Let me just say that. So anyway, I'm not making this up. Get the book Red Horizons by whatever his first name is, Pachipa, P-A-C-E-P-A-A. Um, I got it used over the internet for a couple of bucks at the time, but uh, used books have gotten a lot more expensive since uh, the book selling over the internet got to be a bigger business. But anyway, there you have it. So, and the why, what does this have to do with today's conspiracy theory? Um, okay, I will say this. I wasn't planning to, of course, all the fun stuff I wasn't planning to say. Um, I think on last episode uh, on the descriptions, I'm not 100% sure, I think I put a link to a YouTube video of another KGB defector uh, who defected to the United States in the early 1990s. And he talks about what the plan was, what Moscow's plan was for defeating the West and actually for establishing a worldwide communist government. And he says that most of that plan, over 80%, 85% of the KGB's activity, was uh, ideological infiltration, uh, basically a brainwashing of the West through taking over the educational institutions and uh, educating a whole generation or more. And this uh, basically an ideological warfare. That was by far the heart of the plan. That was the vast majority of what they were devoted to. And um, so, and, and, and I believe that what we're looking at now with the pandemic is actually a part of the plan um, to subject, basically to defeat the West. And um, the connection there is they had to turn our brains into mush before anyone would believe the underlying science or structure of the pandemic. Um, and uh, I don't know, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I made reference to Event 201 in, I think, the first live stream I did. But, you know, you can follow that trail. Start with Event 201. But anyway, uh, anyway, so basically what I'm saying is that according to this KGB defector, remember the KGB that ran the Palestinians, that, that came up with the PLO, that came up with the Palestinian state, is the same KGB that ran the... Um, uh, ideological brainwashing campaign to turn the West's brains into this inability, inability to see facts that are presented right before their eyes. And I think we have the facts presented before our eyes about the coronavirus and society's response to the coronavirus. Um, in, in, in other words, even in the worst statistics, the death rate is nothing like we were told it was going to be. And if you're an American, you may remember, do you remember way back when, are our memories good enough to go back like two whole months to maybe February, when the government told us that, um, you know, there'd be a kind of a shutdown and that businesses would have to shut down and we couldn't have mass gatherings and so forth. Do you remember it was going to be for two weeks to flatten the curve? Because the problem was that if this pandemic hit all at once, 
There'd be so many sick people that the hospitals would be flooded and we wouldn't have enough ventilators. Do you remember that magic word ventilator that all the governors are up in arms about? We wouldn't have enough hospital beds. We wouldn't have enough ICUs. We wouldn't have enough ventilators. So to flatten the curve, in other words, to spread out the infection, to spread out the, the you know, becoming ill, we would have to flatten the curve so the same number of people would get ill, but the hospitals wouldn't be inundated, wouldn't be overrun. Now, of course, the hospitals have laid off most of their staff um, because the hospitals are all empty. I talked to a friend of mine whose son is a um, ICU nurse in uh, Florida. Granted, Florida is not one of the worst hit states. But he said they were basically all furloughed, the hospital staff. And they had one, they had three, I think, COVID-19 patients total and one who was seriously ill in the entire whatever it's been, two and a half months. So anyway, but has the lockdown gone away? No, it's actually gotten worse. It's actually gotten worse. Um, until two weeks ago, I could go to Home Depot, you know. Now, now they only let in so many people and you have to go up one aisle and down another aisle. And this is after, after there obviously wasn't any a shortage of hospital space or hospital supplies, okay? And it's not going away. Anyway, so anyway, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know what people who believe in this stuff, I mean, and then I'm going to get back to Judaism, okay? But my point is, I don't know what people who believe that we are in crisis mode that requires shutting down the economy, what they what their memories do with the memory of why the economy was shut down. Because the economy wasn't shut down so that fewer people would die from COVID-19. The economy was shut down so that they wouldn't all die at once. And so that there'd be the hospital facilities to treat people who got seriously ill. It wasn't so that fewer people would get seriously ill. Um, now, there's plenty of hospital space and no more people have gotten seriously ill than get seriously ill in a normal bad flu season. And that's even with the inflated numbers, which is a whole nother topic. Uh, the deaths, I think, in the United States are uh, now about 83,000, um, which is a, a bad flu season, but it's not an unheardofly bad flu season. And the um, apparently, the presence of antibodies, in other words, the percent of the population that already have antibodies is, if I remember correctly, between, you know, depending on the geographic area and the, and the study, what, 25% to 40% or something? which means that hundreds of millions, over 100 million Americans have, have, the, have been exposed to it, you know, and yet the economy still has to be shut down. And thank God masses are resuming where I live um, next week. Thank God. Praise be to God. But only 50 people in the church at a time, only every other pew, six feet apart from people, and most churches are requiring masks. Come on. Brains had to be turned to mush. And that was actually the plan that this KGB defector narrates in this um, uh, YouTube. Well, it wasn't a YouTube video. Now it's a YouTube video. It was a TV interview back in the early uh, 90s. So you might want to be interested in, in looking at that to see how we got this far. And the other thing that's kind of neat that he says there is he says, look, I defected to the West. I defected to the United States. I feel sorry for you guys because when our plan succeeds, there's going to be nowhere for you to defect to. There's going to be nowhere for you to run to. Aren't we in that situation, right? Fat lot of good it does to run to England or to run to France or to run to Italy. Okay, so it looks like their plan has succeeded. And their plan has also succeeded in um, establishing a worldwide consensus that there are a Palestinian people and there should be a Palestinian state. Anyway, why why that was part of their plan, I'll have to leave for some time when I'm actually intending to talk about politics. So anyway, um, okay, back to whatever on earth I was talking about. What was I talking about? Let me reconstruct. Okay, I was talking about, wow, I was talking about Wow, I'm all, I'm in 130 AD and, and Hadrian, and somehow I got to 2020 AD. 
Okay, so that's where the name Palestine came from. And that's also, of course, Hadrian was going to rebuild Jerusalem, naming it Aelia Capitolinus, which precipitated the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is where I was. Bar Kokhba successfully recruited all of the, um, the uh, Council of Jamnia to his cause. And they all said he was the Messiah, which is why they changed his name to Bar Kokhba, son of the star, from Ben Kosiba, which was his given name uh, because they were acknowledging him, him as the Messiah. And the number one rabbi threw his weight about, behind him and then it was all over. Then what happened was all Jews were under this moral compulsion to, to uh, take up arms and fight against the Romans because this was not a political rebellion. Now this was the Messiah who is telling you to take up arms and fight against the Romans. Now, what Jews do you think refused to take up arms and fight against the Romans as followers of the Messiah Bar Kokhba? Well, the Jews who were followers of Jesus, who were in the church, because, of course, they knew that the Messiah was Jesus. They knew that Bar Kokhba wasn't the Messiah, and they would be apostatizing from their faith in Jesus if they took up arms in, in support of a false Messiah. That's why they were excommunicated. They were excommunicated for failing to follow Bar Kokhba. They were excommunicated not for following the false messiah, Jesus, but they were excommunicated for failing to follow the false messiah, Bar Kokhba, which the entire Jewish world, you know, 10 years later, realized was a false messiah and does to this day. So I have lost my salvation, mea culpa, for not following Bar Kokhba. Excuse me, did I say mea culpa or Bar Kokhba? Anyway, blah, blah. I don't know, my brain is mush. Okay, so there you have that. That's one, another, that's a reason why this is really neat, religiously, I think. Uh, anyway, the revolt succeeded for three years. It established a Jewish state of which Bar Kokhba was the ruler, the prince, the Nazi, Naz, Nazi? <laughs> you better stay away from that word. But um, the Romans succeeded in breaking the revolt and um, capturing Bar Kokhba and wiping out very cruelly wiping everything out. And in fact, um, there was a uh, capital, so to speak, where there was a major center of the Jews um, and the name of that. I'm still on, I'm still on the first two of the, um, of the Tisha B'Av disasters. Remember Tisha B'Av being the ninth of Av. But um, I'll get back to that screen now. So anyway, the Bar Kokhba revolt was crushed and uh, the major city, Betar, which had over 500,000 people who were killed, I think it's the general estimate is about 560,000 people killed in 135 AD, at the time that the Bar Kokhba revolt was crushed. And guess what day of the Jewish calendar the Bar Kokhba revolt was crushed? It was also the ninth day of Av. It was also this day of disaster, uh, Tisha B'Av, the same day that the 12 spies came back saying we can't enter uh, the promised land and they got the punishment of 38 more years in the desert and they wouldn't be able to enter themselves. That generation would have to die. The same day that the first temple was destroyed and the Babylonian exile began, the ninth day of Av, the same day the second temple was destroyed by the Romans and, and the end of Jerusalem, and the same day that the Bar Kokhba revolt was crushed, the very same day and also, a year later, on that very same day, to build Elia Capitolina was the day that the site of the temple was, I like to say, bulldozed. They didn't have bulldozers. It was plowed. That must have been a lot of work. But somehow, they plowed the temple site in order to make it a clean sheet for the building of the temple, of, excuse me, the temple to Zeus, Elia Capitolina. And all of those five disasters happen on the very same day on the Jewish calendar, the 9th of Av. Now, I think it's really beautiful. I'm going to end soon because I can't keep you guys forever. Somebody's asking, so I'll say, um, uh, Av falls in August usually. Uh, the ninth day of Av falls in August. Av is essentially 
uh, collinear with with August. I mean, it, um, that's not the word, but it's, it occurs, you know, if you want to find Av on our calendar, I would call Av August. The 9th of Av, Av is always in August or I believe early September. But this is very interesting. I'm going to have to end the show here and uh, I'll pick up what day is today. Today is, um, well, I wasn't going to do a show on on uh, Sunday. Um, boy, um, now I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hesitating because of the mass schedule, actually, because masses are supposed to be in. Oh, they won't begin yet on this Sunday. That's for sure. So, OK, I will do a show on Sunday, same time, three o'clock on Sunday. I'll pick up where I left off. But anyway, so where was I? OK, they plowed the side of the temple on the ninth day of Av in 136 AD. And so that was the last of these ninth day of Av disasters that I'm going to talk about today. But Av falls in August. So I like to think that, oh, and let me just say something else. From God's perspective, of course, this is not like, doesn't have to be weird coincidence, because as I keep saying, God gets to write history. He gets to write history. He gets to send us his messages through historical events. So we are doing God a tremendous disservice if we don't see the beauty of his pattern, the beauty of his creativity, you know, the, the beauty of his, his aesthetics in the way he writes history itself. I talked about this with all of the echoes of Judaism and Christianity and Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac and the crucifixion and so forth. Anyway, let's let's give God honor and glory and praise for his writing of human history, including his writing of the second coming, whenever that may be. But I hope to see you all on the second on the other side. Anyway, so given all of that and given that the ninth day of Av would translate in some sense to the ninth day of August, let me just end this show by um, bringing up another last, another last coincidence of two things that happened on the ninth day of August, because I can't see a ninth day of August come by without thinking of it as the ninth day of off, even though it isn't. So let me just show you just for fun, for what it's worth, two events that happened on the ninth day of August. One is that, um, uh, Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, was martyred at Auschwitz on the 9th day of August, 1942. And the atomic bomb fell on Nagasaki on the 9th day of August, 1945. There, that is a genuine photograph of the Nagasaki bomb explosion. And why might the bomb on Nagasaki be particularly interesting to God? I don't want to say more interesting to God than the bomb that fell on Hiroshima a couple of days earlier. Well, I am going to try to tell you why. Nagasaki was the capital of the Catholic Church in Japan, basically. It was the, I believe it was the largest Catholic community in Japan. Um, there was a Jesuit. Um, I know there was a house of Jesuit missionaries in the center of Nagasaki at ground zero, almost exactly where the bomb fell. There was a um, Franciscan monastery established by um, Colby, by Maximilian Colby in Nagasaki. Now, Maximilian Colby, remember, he was only uh, generate, not even a generation earlier, right? Because he died, he died at Auschwitz also. Um, uh, Maximilian Colby went to Nagasaki and established a Franciscan monastery there which was still there. Um, there was a lot of Catholic activity in Nagasaki. I'll have to look this up, but dollars to donuts, I'm willing to bet that Nagasaki was the center of the capital of the Catholic Church in Japan. And so I think it is very, very interesting that Nagasaki, the bomb fell on August 9th. Now, as long as I'm saying all of this, there is a wonderful, wonderful book I'll try to remember to put it on the description that I recommend to everybody that's called Song for Nagasaki. That is the um, account 
the biography of a um, Shinto, of a, a pagan doctor in Nagasaki who became a Catholic. And uh, he lived through the uh, bombing and he basically uh, spent the rest of his life, he died pretty quickly because he spent the rest of his life uh, tending to the uh, radiation victims. Uh, there's also a very beautiful story about the Jesuits, I believe, being miraculously spared when the bomb fell. And I will tell my, the last really neat story, which is true, which is when would it have been maybe the 1930s that Maximilian Kolbe had established the city of the Immaculata in uh, Poland. And then he became a missionary and he went to Japan and he established a city of the Immaculata in Nagasaki, a um, uh, Franciscan monastery, which would also be a center of missionary activity. From it, he published a Catholic, uh, actually a Japanese language version of his Catholic newspaper, Night of the Immaculata, which was the largest selling daily newspaper in Europe. And he established, uh, he, he started publishing a Japanese language version of it in Nagasaki, which would have been another reason Nagasaki was the Catholic capital of, of Japan. And but when he built the monastery, he, he I don't know, I suppose he was given a large plot of land, which was basically the whole side, a whole mountain outside of Nagasaki, small hill outside of Nagasaki. And he built his monastery, not overlooking the town of Nagasaki, but on the far side of the hill on the back side of the hill. And his monks said, here, you know, we have this whole mountaintop. You know, why are you building on the wrong side of the mountain? Why don't you build it on the side of the mountain overlooking the city of Nagasaki? And what was St. Maximilian Kolbe's response? It was, one day you will know why. And when the atomic bomb fell on Nagasaki, the monastery was not affected because it was shielded by the mountain itself because because uh, Colby had built the monastery on the backside of the mountain. So, wow, isn't that all incredibly neat? And uh, this has been about two hours. So thank you for your uh, bearing with me, for those of you who have borne with me. And um, I will go out. I know, blah, blah, blah. I know that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not totally on top of the... Um, technology here. So I'm going to try to go out with the screen that I came in with. And um, uh, maybe that'll do it. Who knows? I hope it'll do it. I hope the song will come back when I pull up that screen. And um, the Oh, you're not looking at me. I'm just babbling. Uh, let me get let me get back on so I can at least say goodbye with my face. And um, so anyway, I'll pull up that screen, uh, which was the opening screen. And remember, the music is I uh, is the I forgot to say this. this is another another really neat thing. Um, the music. Let me get the right thing up there. Is the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Now the text is Jeremiah lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem during the Babylonian exile, which took place, of course, um, five eighty six. BC on the Tisha B'Av, on the 9th of Av. But the chant, if you're wondering why does it sound like Catholic chant, is it's actually part of the Holy Week services. It's, it's part of the Tenebrae service. And the um, traditional Catholic Church, uh, tra traditional religious orders, have this um, middle of the night matins service. I believe it's a matin service. Wouldn't bet my life on it. It might be Vespers or Lauds, where they sing this chant of uh, the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Now, I found this English language version, so you can tell it's about the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, it's incredibly beautiful. I, I Until I got married, I spent Holy Week at a monastery where I'm an oblate, a Benedictine monastery where I'm an oblate, pretty much every Holy Week. And so I would be in the um, loft listening to this chant this the service is called um tenebrae which means shadows because it's done in the dark 
And they're singing about, it's all straight from the Jewish scriptures. And it's, you know, it's 100% Judaism. And they're singing this heart-rending, mournful music about the destruction of Jerusalem. And they are bemoaning the destruction of Jerusalem and the fate of the Jewish people for having crucified their Messiah. And they are interspersing it with antiphons which um, move, kind of transfer that mourning over what happened to Jerusalem in 586 BC, in 70 AD, uh, onto what happened to the Jewish Messiah, what happened to Jesus. So they're interspersing it on scenes from the Passion. So I thought it was absolutely the perfect uh, music for the show and image for the show. So with that, God bless you, and I hope to see you back. Bye. For now. Begins a lamentation of Jeremiah the prophet. Alleluia. city. A widow is she who had been mistress of the nations. Into slavery has fallen the princes of kingdoms. Unceasingly she weeps by night, and with tears her cheeks are laden. Among her suitors there is none to console her. Her seeming friends have rejected her and are become her enemies. Her assailant sorrow pressing her, and her enemies are prospering. For the Lord has spoken against her, because of the multitude of her iniquities. Her children are led into captivity before the face of her oppressors. Departed from the daughter of Sion. Her nobles are become like rams that find no pasture. Without strength, therefore, they walk before their pursuit. 